Al Jazeera Podcasts. Today, Israel is fighting on three fronts. The Israeli fighter jet struck Houthi military targets near Yemen's Hodeida port, killing at least three people and wounding 87. In the wake of a deadly Houthi drone attack on Tel Aviv, Israel targets Yemen and Lebanon. Is it a sign of strength or weakness? I'm Kevin Hurton, and this is The Take. The fuel depot at the Yemeni port of Hodeida is in charred ruins after Israeli jets bombed it over the weekend. The Israelis say this port is used to smuggle Iranian-made drones, like the one that hit Tel Aviv early Friday morning. Houthi rebels in Yemen claim responsibility for the attack, which killed one person and injured at least 10 others. They say the strike... Now, Iran disputes this, but it's undisputed that this port is crucial for aid shipments to prevent a hunger crisis in Yemen. Regardless, it's clear the Houthis have now announced themselves as key players in this conflict. The Houthi have always been like a pebble in the shoe, I'd say. Yes, they are attacking Israel. They managed to kill somebody in Israel. My name is Zoran Kusovac, and I'm a geopolitical and security analyst. I cover Southeast Europe, East Europe, and the Middle East. The Houthis have been... They've been sending missiles at Israel for a while now. Um, the one that struck Tel Aviv reportedly only hit its target because of human error. And in response, Israel launches this airstrike on a port, which is a civilian target, right? Um, what do you make of this move by Israel from a strategic point of view? Do you think that this attack on the port is likely to deter the Houthis from further action? No, definitely not. This attack has had several different results. The first is uh, purely military, it's limited. So, although these targets, the oil facility, the power station, they are touted as civilian, I have to say that uh, in modern warfare, the difference between civilian and the dual use and military infrastructure is very, very difficult to establish. So, of course, uh, that fuels the military as well, that uh, power station powers the military facilities as well. So I don't think uh, that should be taken as focus. Of course, military targets, purely military targets in Yemen have been hit many times uh, from December. Um, the radars, uh, the missile uh, development centers, missile warehouses, etc. So Yemen continues to target Israel. And they're getting good at that. I have to say, many people were surprised at the very beginning of the Houthi attacks at Israel, how sophisticated their arsenal was. Yes, they started with Iranian missiles, rockets, drones, that in many cases themselves were copies of Western technology. But they have achieved remarkable success in developing those and extending the range and um, finding new paths for them. So it was inevitable that one would actually hit its target. Whether it's human mistake, uh, that's of course just an excuse for Israeli public. But uh, actually this is how wars get fought. Uh, your enemies try to exploit every weakness, including human weaknesses. Some operator somewhere has to fall asleep after working so many days and weeks and months um, for long hours. So this was inevitable. So you said that this won't deter the Houthis. And in fact, a Houthi political official told Al Jazeera, this will only increase our determination to stop the genocide in Gaza. These attacks from Israel will never affect our stand, which is in support always of our brothers in Palestine. This will increase our determination to work hard to stop the genocide in Gaza. 
So it's not going to have a deterrent effect based on the threat of of being bombed. But I guess the other question is, would it have a deterrent effect on its capability to strike again into Israel? Not significantly, no. Hmm. Basically, these targets were chosen not just for their symbolic value, but also for their propaganda value. Videos of an oil ter- terminal burning, huge fires with unbelievably huge plumes of smoke, that makes for good video. That will satisfy Israeli public back at home. Look what we can do to them just the day after they hit us. So no, this will not deter the Yemenis. This will not even damage their military potential significantly. There have been a number of attacks. There have been a number of precise attacks on their production facilities, on their missile warehouses. And uh, they show that they are very capable, versatile, mobile. On the other hand, in many ways, the Houthis see this as an opportunity. An opportunity to strengthen their position internally. Remember, Yemen is not unified. The Houthis are in a perpetual battle for control against the Saudi-backed government. I've been monitoring the reactions by Houthi officials, uh, intellectuals, supporters of Yemen in general or the Houthi movement, and all of them definitely show that they all think that this is a chance for Yemen to unite behind the Houthis. They're saying, until now, until we were directly attacked by Israel, there could have been various excuses as to why not everybody is with us. But now there is no more excuse. And whoever does not join the Houthi-led fight against Israel is a Yemeni traitor. Is Israel losing its war on Gaza? That's after the break. So, Zoran, the last time we spoke, you told us that it would be incredibly difficult for the Israelis to prosecute this war against Hamas. So, with that in mind, give us an update. Did Israel prove to be more or less successful than you predicted back then? Well, it's difficult because one risks coming out as a cynic, uh, saying it's all as expected. The number of civilian uh, casualties in Gaza is staggering. It's, uh, it is shameful that this should happen anywhere on earth. But this is the way that Israel fights because it can, because it has domestic support. It basically still runs high on this, we need to revenge, we need to vindicate our victims. It is not about freeing the hostages anymore. Uh, that line of uh, we want to free the hostages has gone down. We don't hear much about freeing hostages. It is now just the continuation, just the humiliation, just the hammering of Gaza. And I don't think that anyone in the Israeli war cabinet or in the Israeli military highest circles has a clear idea of how to win in Gaza because there's still very, very big problem of people not being able to leave Gaza. So you can keep pushing them from one part of Gaza to another. You can go into Khan Yunis and have them go into Gaza City or the other way around or you know, push them to the coast. But simply, there's two million people there that are a physical presence. The only way to pacify Gaza would be to completely rid it of its population. You can't do that. You can't kill two million people. You can't expel them into Egypt. You can't send them anywhere else. And there is absolutely no logical way out. Okay, so you said that the Israeli military doesn't know how to win this war. That does beg the question, from a military perspective, is Israel losing this war on Gaza? Well, militarily, it is not losing it. But uh, wars are not 
uh, either won or lost purely in military terms. The U.S. was not defeated militarily in Vietnam, mm. but it lost Vietnam, it lost Southeast Asia. So it is not the question of losing the war militarily. It's the question of uh, what comes as a strategic outcome. For the Gazans, it is very clear. The strategic goal of the Gazans is to survive. For Israel, it is not clear. Their stated goal was to defeat Hamas. Again, Hamas is a typical guerrilla force. It's a manda population. And it's a moot point whether Hamas is underground or if it's in buildings. Uh, the Hamas generally, unless you specifically know who's a member, are unrecognizable from uh, non-Hamas, from pure civilians. They wear the same clothes, they eat the same food, they move through the same streets, and there is no way of eradicating Hamas except for total clearing of the territory. Let's talk about Iran, because a common foe, a commonality between all three of these theaters that we talked about, Hezbollah, Yemen, and um, and even Hamas, is, is Iran. Um, there was some news this weekend, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Iran is one or two weeks away from being able to create nuclear material. They haven't produced a weapon itself, but that's something, of course, that we track very, very carefully. And you put those two things together, the fissile material an explosive device, and you have a nuclear weapon. So we're focused on that. Um, what we've seen in the So last, um, how does this possibility of a nuclear-armed Iran change the fundamentals of, of this conflict and maybe just the power dynamics in the region more broadly? We have to ask ourselves, who is in the nuclear club? Because Israel itself has had is believed to have had nuclear weapons for about 40 years now. It has a, an official policy of uh, plausible deniability, so it doesn't uh, confirm it, it doesn't deny it. But Israel, having had nuclear arms for 40 years, India and Pakistan having had them for over 30, they have not used it. So why do we believe that Iran would use nuclear weapons? I'm sure that Iranian nuclear scientists, many of, him, of whom have been trained in the West, are fully aware of all the doctrinary issues of the use of nuclear power. So Iran, for all we know, might already have some limited nuclear capacity. But it doesn't mean that it would be any different from Israel or North Korea or Pakistan or any other country that gets to have nuclear weapons. And then realizes that you can't just use them easily. No one has used nuclear weapons since 1945. That club has now grown into a two-figure number of states. And everyone is showing the restraint because everyone is aware that this is not something that you can take lightly. Oh, let's drop a small tactical nuke. It doesn't work that way. So I don't think necessarily that Iran would behave differently to anybody else. So I want to ask you about Netanyahu, because it does seem to come down to him. He's the man who is still in control, who he's in Washington this week talking to, uh, to officials there. The sad fact is he, he seems to have no incentive to end the war. I mean, talking just general legacy, how do you think history will remember this man who has dominated Israeli politics for, for most of my lifetime, at least? Uh, that will largely depend on his end, on his political end, because for all we know, there is a lot of opposition to Netanyahu in Israel. There is a lot of uh, resentment. There is a lot of mistrust. But Israelis, like most countries that fight repeated long wars, and they don't challenge their leaders in wartime. They wait for a more stable time. So whenever the military stage of this war will end, it will be the question of how Israelis deal with Netanyahu, whether the majority of Israelis will hold him personally responsible for the intelligence failure that led to October 7th, whether they will hold him responsible for the loss of life 
in nine months of fighting for the uncertainty that Israel is in. So this will all depend on how Israeli society handles it. And I'm not sure. It's a notoriously divided society. The dynamics of Israel is very curious. Uh, with the latest decision to start drafting the Haredim, the extreme religious uh, Jews who have been spared from military service, that in itself will certainly have an effect within Israeli society. It's hard to predict. There might be a confrontation, there might be a relief. Many liberal Israelis have been asking for years for those who pray to God to also go and fight like everybody else. So now they are getting their drafting orders for 2025, and it will be very interesting to see how that will affect Israeli society. Is this the most vulnerable and isolated you've seen Israel since uh, maybe the 1970s? You need to understand that Israel has changed several times since its creation. The first generations, they were the pioneers, the creators, then came the defenders. And then came the huge influx from Eastern Europe, particularly Russia. And um, I'm not sure how those former Russian Jews, who are now living in Israel in significant numbers, how well they are integrated. So you can draft them, you can send them to fight, but as soon as the situation goes uh, back to uh, peace mode, it's a question of how much in the mainstream they want to be. So Israel is getting more and more fragmented. We see Israel at, uh, at times of crisis, and we think there is one Israel, no, there's many Israels. And the internal dynamics between these groups is unbelievably complex and very interesting, and for me, quite unpredictable. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Khalid Sultan and Ashish Malhotra, with Duha Mossad, Manahil Navid, Veronique Ashaya, Mohammed Zain Shafi Khan, and me, Kevin Hurton, in for Malika Bilal. It was edited by Noor Wazwaz. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back tomorrow.